Good evening, everybody. We'd like to go ahead and get started. If you could please take your seats, we're going to get started. Really? I'll get right in there. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. So if you're here for the Sinead Village Neighborhood Meeting, you are in the correct location. My name is Bill Rose, and I'm a supervising planner with the City of Santa Rosa. My name is on the public notice that you all received. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, we know that this is definitely uh, taking a bite out of your time, and we really appreciate this. Before I get started, I wanted to acknowledge the city staff that are assisting me tonight. So joining me as a co-moderator is Serena Lino. She is our Administrative Services Officer for the Planning Department. And we have a number of other staff members that are scattered throughout. And so if all of you could just raise your hand quickly. Patrick, Jessica, Claire, Monet, out in the lobby we have Andrew, we have Adam. All of the city staff can be identified by their badges. So they'll either be wearing them on their hips or on their lapels. And uh, you'll see in a few minutes that we have a, an interactive segment of the presentation a little bit later and all of those staff members will be involved. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Serena, who's going to go over the agenda for tonight. Good evening, uh, excuse me, good evening, everybody. I'm going to come around the podium, so it's a little easier for me. Um, so uh, as Bill mentioned, uh, the agenda for the evening, we have it set up in a few different segments. And so it's going to provide an opportunity for all of your questions and your comments to get answered this evening. So we're going to start off uh, with an overview of the project. Bill will be providing that for you. And then we're going to turn it over to the developer to go over the project itself with more specific details. We ask that as they're doing their presentations, uh, many of you collected some post-it cards as you were signing in this evening. Some of you have already submitted some questions. Thank you for that. But please keep note of some of your questions along the way. So then the next segment is we're going to be doing a structured Q&A session. So we'll collect all of those questions from you and then we'll read them off for the panel to answer. After we conclude that portion, we're also going to provide opportunities for folks to come up and speak up here at the microphone. So if your question is still unanswered, this will be another opportunity for you to speak as well. And then finally, at the end of the evening, uh, we will have staff and the developers stationed uh, wherever you see the, the, the photos of the project. So you, there'll be a staff assigned to each one of those photos so you can go up and ask personal, more specific questions if you like. So the idea behind this is to provide different types of opportunities for you to ask questions and provide some comments throughout the evening. Okay, and then we do ask that uh, when you are asking your questions that there is a lot of people in this room. It's very packed, and so there's a lot of people that have lots of questions. And so we want to be able to honor that, and we ask that you please be concise as possible um, to allow for as many questions to be answered this evening. Let's see here, a few little um, housekeeping things for you. Uh, if you need it, we do have Spanish interpretation services available, and you can look for Julie in the back of the room. She's waving her hands if you need those. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Um, we also have child care services that are being provided by Recreation and Parks in the Cypress Room, which is just out the doors to the left. Um, if you need the restrooms, they are directly outside these doors. We go straight back, so there's restrooms for you if, if needed. And then finally, uh, we want to let you know that we are recording this um, meeting this evening because there are several folks that cannot attend, and so we wanted to be able to make sure to capture all of this information for those folks. And it will be posted on our website at a later time. And then finally, um, we will have, the website is actually up live. It's available for you to access as of now. And we're going to be using that as our opportunity to provide you with regular updates about this particular project. So we ask that you please go and visit. Um, if you have not signed up to receive direct emails about for updates about the project, there's an opportunity for you to sign up for the distribution list on the website or um, many of you who came in and signed in at the tables out in the lobby, you may have signed your email address there. If you did not get a chance to do that, please feel free to sign up before you leave this evening, or again, you could just go on the website and then you can sign up there as well. Okay, I think with that, we are gonna 
turn it back over to Bill and he will start the presentation. Great, thank you, Serena. So I'd like to begin by describing the neighborhood meeting and what its objective is. So I'm just gonna quickly read, this is right out of our zoning code, and it says a pre-application neighborhood meeting is required. It is required for each discretionary project uh, shall require a pre-application neighborhood meeting in compliance with the following requirements to provide the opportunity for early input by affected neighbors. While neighborhood consensus or agreement is the goal, it is not a required outcome of neighborhood meetings. So, <laughs> I'm feeling like there's gonna be a lot of consensus tonight. <laughs> <clears throat> so, right in the title it says, pre-application neighborhood meeting. The city has not received development applications. All we have received essentially are the graphics you see tonight uh, and a project description. And we have reviewed this project. We do know what entitlements will be required, so I'm going to describe those in a minute. But we've not done a detailed analysis. So I will apologize in advance if there are questions that we are not able to answer because we have not done that analysis. Uh, but part of tonight's meeting is for us to take feedback from you. So essentially, it's a meeting for the developer to introduce this project to the neighborhood, and it's an opportunity for the developer and city staff to take your feedback, to take your questions, answer them the best that we can, and to take your comments so we can enter them into the record and they can inform us as we go forward. So that's the goal for tonight's meeting. I'm gonna go over the required entitlements uh, that are required from the city of Santa Rosa for this project. The first we have is the general plan amendment. So every parcel in the city has a general plan designation. That is the highest level of land use uh, governance on a property. And so this project needs to change the land use designation. That means it'll go to the planning commission and it'll ultimately be decided on by the city council. The next is a rezoning, so your zoning classification, which every parcel has, is what implements the visions of the general plan. So you think of the general plan as it's general, it's broad, and the zoning is more specific, and it implements that goal. And so this project needs to change the zoning as well. The next is a tentative map. That's the formal name for a subdivision of land. So this project will include a subdivision. That will go to the Planning Commission. In Santa Rosa, any development, and that's very broadly defined, that occurs on slopes over 10% requires a hillside development permit. The next is a conditional use permit. It's exactly what the name says. It permits certain land uses under certain conditions. And then the last is the major design review, and that's where the city's design review board, our design body, will review this project uh, and, and take action. All of these are subject to public hearings, so if you received a notice for tonight's meeting, you will receive notices for all of these. And if you didn't, we encourage you to sign into our checklist so you can get future notifications. The next item I'd like to discuss is the environmental review. So the California Environmental Quality Act is the law that governs environmental review in the state. And this project is going to be subject to an environmental impact report, also known as an EIR. And that is the highest level of environmental review that you can do. I make that note because there's been a lot of discussion recently about AB 2267. You may have seen the article in the paper this weekend. And that is the city's efforts to basically exempt or streamline projects. And I want to be very clear that this project will not be subject to that provision. That is for specific areas in the city and it is not where this project is located. So this project will not be exempt, quite the contrary, it will be subject to the highest level of environmental review. The next thing I'd like to mention is the timeline. So a project of this complexity is generally on an 18 to 24 month timeline. It is a housing project, and by policy, city, the city is expediting review and putting you know, a lot of resources onto housing projects. We will be doing that, even with those resources, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute. It still will be probably an 18 to 24 month process. Going forward, the next steps 
we are currently, we have them in draft form. We will be issuing two requests for proposals. So the city is going to enlist the services of outside consultants, one to do the environmental impact report. They will be in contract with the city. They will report to the city. The city will not be funding that. That will be funded by the consultant, but the contract will be with the city. And the selection of that consultant is done by the city. Similarly, the city is working on another request for proposal, and this will go out concurrently with the EIR proposal for staffing assistance. So the idea will be to, again, uh, look for a planning consultant firm or individual that can help on the day-to-day -day project management. Again, they will report to city staff. City staff will select that consultant. It will be paid for by the applicant. The next meeting that will occur, public meeting, is concept design review. So a project like this is required to go to the design review board in a conceptual fashion. So largely the plans you see tonight will be presented to the design review board. The meetings are held on alternate Thursdays at the city council chambers at City Hall. Uh, we have not confirmed the date, but I would make a note of August 2nd. Uh, that's a likely target for this meeting. These are not public hearings, and so therefore they're not publicly noticed. However, we will announce this through our social media and through our website. So as Serena mentioned, our website is gonna be our tool to continue to funnel information. So srcity.org forward slash shenate is the website and we'll announce that concept design review at that um, on that website with that i'm going to turn it over to the applicant team they're going to okay they're going to go through the project details and then we're going to get back into the uh the heart of the meeting tonight which is to take public comment and I have to step in for just a moment. Um, so we have a very full room, and so we have some capacity issues that we need to deal with for just a moment. So um, if you have an empty seat next to you, can you please raise your hand or squish in so we can fill in some of these seats? Because um, we actually need to clear the doorway back there for safety reasons. Um, and also, too, if you could, you could squeeze along down the side, but there's a couple seats up here. There's a few here, maybe one or two over here. Um, but we do need to make sure to clean that space or the, the doorways in the back. And please feel free to come along down the sides as well. And um, I, I hear a, a couple phones, so if we could please take a moment to check your phones and make sure and all your devices to make sure they're on silent. That would be great. There's a couple here. Feel free to come all the way down here to the front or over here to the sides. Okay. It's a tight squeeze. Okay. Thank you. Is it on? Hello? Yeah. Ten minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay, two more than that. Probably fifteen. Go for it. Do what you need to do. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. How are you all? My name is Kamran Shah Husseini. I am uh, with Sinead Community Development Partners. I'm a partner and uh, the project lead. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say um, this is this is amazing. This is this is actually wonderful. And uh, this level of passion and commitment uh, to your community, I think, is a, a very positive thing. So I want to say thank you all very very much for coming out. I know uh, time is time is tight for most, and so uh, thank you. I want to start out uh, with. Um, essentially what's there now. As you can see, and I'm sure you all know, you've driven by it a couple times, um, there's currently uh, the Sutter Hospital, which has been, uh, which has been abandoned, and um, a lot of county, uh, county buildings across the street, the county campus. 
uh, many of those are no longer uh, no longer functioning as well. Um, I'm going to essentially walk you through our proposal. It is a conceptual proposal, so we'll start there. Um, it's what we are intending to turn into the city, uh, but it's uh, very early on in the process, and there's going to be a lot of this type of process um, that we're going to go through. So here is the site plan, um, and what you'll see are essentially three separate neighborhoods. So conceptually what we tried to do is create three separate neighborhoods to break up the campus and get a, a feeling of community in each one. So you're going to have very different architecture in each community. So you have your first here, your second here, and your third here. Uh, it was really important to provide services in each community and so that you don't have to go all the way to one area for, for all of your needs. Um, so again, we really wanted that feeling of community within each of these uh, neighborhoods, we'll call them. I'll move forward. So this is the hospital building. Now, um, it looks an awful lot like the hospital building that's there because um, what we've done is we've actually found some, uh, some pictures from the original New Deal hospital that was built and um, we're going to do everything in our power to rebuild that hospital identically except up to code. So it's going to have all the new, uh, all the new, the bells and whistles on the inside, but look very much like the original New Deal hospital. That was the whitewashed uh, Spanish colonial design. I have our architect here. He's probably shooting daggers my way. No? Yeah? Spanish colonial? All right. I nailed it. Um, it's going to have the red tile roof. It's going to have the whitewashed uh, uh, stucco and uh, be very much in that style. What we intend to do is carry that architectural style throughout all of the different types of housing in that area. So these are all multifamily buildings. Here are some townhomes, and here is some commercial. So if I can show you what the commercial building looks like, again, keeping with that same style. Uh, we have a long-standing relationship with Oliver's Markets. Um, we built the Bell Village Shopping Center, uh, where uh, the Oliver's is currently the new Oliver's. And so um, we've uh, offered them right of first refusal uh, to come in here. So we're very excited. Um, we've, again, we'd love to see something, you know, it's going to be, I think we're going to have between 16,000 and 18,000 square feet there. So it's going to be very small and I think probably focus on, you know, to go food, things like that. There may also be uh, some space for a couple of uh, neighborhood restaurants or a cafe. Again, conceptual, but this is, you know, what our, what our intentions are. Keep going backwards, I apologize. So these are uh, some of the, the renderings of the three-story buildings uh, in, in that same area. These are 12-unit apartments. And there is a 24-unit apartment. So something um, I wanted to mention about the original hospital is that, um, it's pretty exciting, is uh, it's going to be multi-use. So we're going to have units on the second floor. Uh, on the first floor, um, we intend to do uh, the marketing and sales office for that particular neighborhood. And um, we also wanted to tie into uh, the, the history that this site has, because it's, it's a remarkable history. And, um, and it's one of healing, and we thought it really should, we should do something to mark that and reflect that, other than, of course, reconstructing that hospital. So um, our intention is to work with uh, Sonoma County Museums and with the JC to create uh, a small uh, museum it's in that building where we can invite K through five classes, high school classes to come through and to learn about how amazing, you know, this site is and was. Um, and so we want to really tie into that, that, that history that's there. Going through here are some renderings of the townhomes that were up along uh, the hospital drive that goes north. Uh, next, we're going to go, oh, sorry, I'm trying to get this pointer right. I'm going to go through a lot of the same thing. There we go. Uh, so now we're heading over here to the larger neighborhood that I think has some interest here a little bit. Um, what we have here is um, amenities for this neighborhood include uh, a soccer field, which we'd really love to, to incorporate there. Uh, 
multi-sport courts, uh, swimming pool, as well as the sales office here, and then multifamily, three-story multifamily. What you see bordering uh, the, the property line are garages, one-story garages, so as to, to minimize the, and, uh, the impact. And then we also have, um, at the very closest, an 80-foot uh, from building to building uh, setback. So I wanted to make that clear. And you can see some of these units here. That would be uh, the recreation building. Uh, this is Oak Knoll, uh, and that's intended to be our senior component. Uh, 260 units of, um, of senior apartments, and um, these will be uh, proposed to be four stories, and they will have an elevator as well as underground parking for all, all of them, just so we're sensitive to that particular need of that population. Uh, these are the furthest away from, from any other housing on the site, um, which is why we kept any four-story component over here. Uh, they also have all of their own amenities, um, very much built to uh, the senior population. Sorry. This is one of those units. And this is a look at the recreation building for that unit. Here are some of the buildings to be maintained on site. Uh, this is the public health lab. Here's the morgue. And finally, we have uh, a, a facility um, run by CAP, uh, Community Action Partnership. So we're going to, um, with, with this CAP property, um, a few things we're gonna do. First, uh, we're going to, we've, we've designed the project around it. We think it's a very important uh, part of the community and serves the community. Um, so we have uh, decided to work with CAP to increase the security involved there, uh, in minimize the impacts of the, of the neighboring uh, development. We're also going to retire the debt, uh, the underlying debt on that property for CAP, and then uh, also gift them that property so that uh, they have an asset that's free and clear that they can then use uh, to continue to sp spread their message and, and further their their goals, so we're, we're happy that we can do that, thrilled we can do that. Um, the other thing we're doing is there is a 55 unit right here, uh, veterans housing uh, set aside. And so this is gonna be a VASH uh, project. Um, VASH are vouchers for homeless veterans that uh, give them the ability to actually get housing. Um, Burbank will be the ones building that project, we will be uh, creating a pad, stubbing all the utilities uh, to that project, and then donating that to, uh, to Burbank so they can build that. So we're, again, something else that we felt very strongly about and we think is gonna be a really good addition uh, to, to the property. Burbank, as you know, has a wonderful reputation. They've been doing this for a very long time and we appreciate them. Uh, some other really important things uh, I wanna go through we didn't want to just come in and uh, serve our own purposes with our own neighborhoods. They already have all of uh, all of the amenities. We wanted to do a few things that created um, created some amenities for the entire neighborhood, um, the greater neighborhood that is Sinead. We recognize it's a it's a wonderful place and it's obviously a tight knit community full of people that care. So we wanted to um, create a few amenities that we think will will add to that uh, feeling of community. We also wanted to integrate this project with the greater community. So over here we have uh, an amphitheater. It's gonna have grass steps um, that, and, a, and a small stage. Uh, we envision you know, K through five classes coming, doing small plays, things like that. Um, you wanna jiggle the, just jiggle the thing. I think it went to sleep. The other one. Yay, get to go through it again. Yeah, oh please, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have to do another quick check about capacity. Um, so I need to encourage folks to please come up alongside here. Our fire marshal is asking us to
please squish in as much as possible and clear the back doorways. Um, sorry for the inconvenience, but we want to make sure everybody is safe. So if everyone could please, maybe you can come up through the aisles as well. There's a space up here for more standing room. Yeah, I think so, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And then um, if, you, if you choose, you could also stand in the lobby just so long as there are access points to get out through the doors. So, okay. I think a little bit more. I think there's a, there's a seat over here. There's a couple more seats up here if anybody wants to come and sit down. Okay. Thank you, people, for uh, raising your hands if there are seats. Folks, there's more seats over here if you'd like to sit down. We're improvising. This works. It's okay. Okay. Hello. All right, that worked out well. I was getting to the uh, the other uh, overall neighborhood amenities. Um, just wanted to point out two more. Um, the next one is uh, a community garden, and that's going to have greenhouses, raised beds. It's going to be fairly large, um, and again, be able to accommodate the overall community. Uh, the third is a large dog park um, right here, and again, um, w we welcome the entire community to use that amenity. We maintain it. Um, we also have uh, about two miles of trails uh, that we're going to be putting in, multi-use uh, trails, uh, walk, walk and bike trails um, that are going to go around the, the water agency property, connecting all three of these to uh, the, uh, the Parcel J, the open space, the Pollen Creek Preserve area. Um, and uh, that, of course, uh, will remain, uh, there will be a conservation easement placed on that property. Uh, we'll be improving the trails so that they're, they're safe and uh, extremely usable and uh, making that connection all the way through to both uh, the three neighborhood, overall neighborhood amenities and uh, the commercial and then uh, a couple of uh, bus stops that will be on Sinead as well uh, in order to serve the community. Um, Last thing I really wanted to touch on, which um, we're, I think, most proud of with this project, is that we are, um, we're proposing 20% uh, affordable, not just 20% affordable, but 20% very low income. There's a really huge difference between affordable and very low income. Um, affordable is, uh, very low income is a classification of affordability. But uh, very low income means that it's going to be 50% of median income. So as an example, a two bedroom, which is right now renting out for 27 or 2800 in the community uh, market rate, will uh, go for around 950 to $980 a month. So this project represents 160 of those units. Um, that is a, that's a major, major amount, and that will create a significant difference, uh, we feel, for the workforce, the working class that is really truly being priced out uh, of this community. We're very worried about that. And, this is our, our way of helping to solve that. Um, additionally, uh, that doesn't include the Burbank, um, 50, the 55 units of, of uh, Vash house, uh, homeless vets housing, which will go in. So that will actually bring this project to over 25% of the total units as uh, either VLI or even more affordable. So uh, that's, that is my presentation. I have um, today with me Robert South, who is our architect, and Brandon Cho, who is a development specialist. Uh, we'll be answering your questions, but uh, again, thank you very much for coming. Uh, your attendance means a lot, and uh, we look forward to working with you all in the future.
Okay, so take a moment and uh, jot down any questions you might have on your cards because that's going to be the next segment of the evening is we're going to take some time to read through some of your questions. So we've already collected several, but if you do have some more, raise your hand and we'll have staff come around. If you could pass it to the sides, that would be helpful. Uh, let's see. Thank you. If we can get our city staff team to please help collect the cards, that'd be very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. Let's grab a couple there. There you go. Yeah, they've. Traffic, so traffic okay. for okay, sure. So this is traffic evacuation in here. Enter exit. Thank you. Configuring the hillside with measure movement removal of material. Neighborhood access to amenities. We have our awesome staff team up here helping us sort them into categories so we can make sure to try to stay on track and as concise as possible. So uh, we're going to start off, um, off with some traffic questions. I guess this is the juicy topic, huh? We're right to the heart of it. Okay. <laughs> well then, okay. So <clears throat> the first question, what about traffic, particularly at commute times? Who is liable for gridlock and accidents? City of Santa Rosa with a question mark. So can you hear me? No. How about now? Thank you. 
ice cream cone microphone, right? Isn't that the rule, I think? Okay, so as I mentioned, environmental impact report. That's the highest level environmental review that we can do. And part of that review will include a number of topical areas. It'll include aesthetics and biological impacts, greenhouse gas impacts. And one of the topical areas is transportation and traffic. So this project is going to require a full traffic impact study. And it is the city's responsibility to evaluate that study, to go through the whole public process. So environmental review at its core is a public process. So all of the meetings, all of the documents, everything associated that with that will be available for public review. Part of tonight's meeting, the message that we'd like to express, in addition to a thank you for coming out tonight, is truly uh, a request that you stay involved because City staff will evaluate this like I have to ask, right? That's going to be a problem. City staff will evaluate all of the documents. We will do site visits. We will do all of the analysis. But it's always the case that people that live in the area really add to this whole evaluation and this process. So what I can tell you is traffic as we are well aware of, is going to be a, a very hot topic throughout, and it is our obligation through environmental review to analyze the traffic impacts. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, this next question is for the development team. What percentage of your budget is planned to pay for required entitlements and reviews? How much do you anticipate the budget to be? And Bill, this might be more of a question for you too, but. I honestly, uh, hello? I need you guys to stand up. I need your so help you stand up. No problem at all. Let me just get the, the volume up. Yeah, I'll stand up too. I'll do both. I honestly have no idea, and uh, it very much has to do with process goes on for uh, the environment hello okay. get in there all right very much has to do with uh, the, the, how in-depth the studies are it, it has to do with the process and we don't know what that process is going to be yet I'm anticipating expensive given this uh, input and, uh, opinions and so I'm uh, I think they're they're trying to fix it. We're we're trying we're trying to work on the sound here. Just a moment. We can use this one. How about that? Hello. Oh, hey. I think. Sorry, guys. Ah. Anyway, I I anticipate. I I could not anticipate what that those costs would be. Um, Unfortunately, this is the beginning of a process, and, and it's one that we, we don't know. Um, we don't know what it's going to be exactly. So well, I couldn't tell you. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 So just quickly, oh, geez. The, uh, the entitlement list that I provided is nearly all of the entitlements that you can ask for with a project. So in terms of fees to the city for those, just the entitlements, it will be in the tens of thousands of dollars. I wouldn't be surprised if it's fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars. The environmental impact report will be in the several hundred thousand dollar range. Two, three, four hundred thousand dollars is probably what will be expected for this project. Then, after entitlements, and I failed to mention it in my presentation, will be the building permit phase. So the eighteen to twenty-four months that I mentioned, that's for planning permits. After that, will be the building permit review, which will take a number of months to go through that. And then there are additional fees. That's where building permit fees, impact fees, et cetera, will be assessed. The applicant. OK. Um, what is the city doing about the building safety due to the fact the proposed site is located on top of the Roger Creek Fault? <laughs> So I suspect a lot of the answers tonight are going to keep pointing back to the EIR that I mentioned. So another topical area will be geotechnical hazards. So part of that will include a detailed geotechnical analysis that will be reviewed by city staff 
and because of the fault activity in the area, we will also be requiring a peer review. So the city will contract with a consulting geological engineer to review all of the studies and to assist the city staff in their conclusions. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Where are the construction workers going to come from? I lost my home in the Tubbs fire, and it will likely be that this project will take our workers away and or increase our prices. Um, when you provide jobs uh, for development, um, prices tend to go down because you're not paying so much for those, those same uh, jobs. We, okay. we as a company have multiple projects uh, that are under construction at any given time throughout the state. And so we have many, many, many subcontractors that are working on those. And those um, we will be able to relocate here in order to build this project. Now this is, uh, this is a ways off, obviously. So um, the, the more, but in the end, the more workforce you have in the area, the better off it's going to be. Because if there's work to be done, they'll stay. It's getting them here in the first place. That's the hard part. Okay. Why are there no single family homes? Part of the stated goals of both the city and the county, uh, and, and I think um, much of Santa Rosa is to get housing built. Um, as many units as we can, uh, we can build. And what I've heard from uh, the, the supervisors is 30,000 uh, units in, in five years, I believe it is. Uh, we, we needed density here because uh, we're actually fairly low in terms of density. As proposed, um, we have uh, a density of, if you take into account uh, the, through the EIR, which we have to do, uh, the sites that we're doing offsite improvements on, we're at 7.4 units an acre, which is uh, really very close to uh, what a small lot subdivision of single family homes would be. Uh, we're at 10.6 uh, if you exclude the disposition properties, so only the property that we're purchasing. We haven't purchased it yet, we're in contract to purchase it. Um, then what you're looking at is actually very low density, but it's uh, in terms of the entire project, but it's focused on certain areas of the project so that we can utilize as much of this project as possible. We believe at this point, um, although um, again, this is preliminary, that there will be around 10 acres of additional development beyond what was there. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so we're going to keep moving along. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? Thank you. Sorry. Um, what I'm saying is, as as it is proposed right now, there will be ten additional acres of development, a little less than ten than what is already developed on the property right now, meaning the paving, the buildings, et cetera. We're redeveloping what was there. So we're building on top of, so as to limit uh, disturbing um, the open space. OK. All right, so this question is regarding low-income housing. How many low-income housing units will the Will there be, and how are you going to monitor the occupancy rate? What was the question? I'm sorry. So this is regarding low-income housing. How many units will there be, and how will you be monitoring the occupancy rate? Sure. As I mentioned in the presentation, there will be 160 uh, proposed uh, very low-income units, and uh, there will be um, 
55 of the VASH uh, housing units built by Burbank. We're partnering with Burbank, who has a long and extensive history of managing those units. And how are you defining very low income? Very low income is 50% of area median income. So again, um, a unit that would rent right now for between 27 and 2800, uh, a multifamily unit, would uh, at this point uh, be between 900 and 1000. So a significant uh, um, savings of cost. And one additional follow-up question, and will there be specific units for seniors and veterans in the low-income units? 20% uh, of the totality of the project, so all of the different types of housing will be uh, VLI. So that means 20% of the senior apartments, 20% of the market rate as well. And then also from the city side, uh, just about the question on how, how that's being monitored. Um, the developer will actually enter into a contract with our housing authority, um, and so it's going to be deed restricted on the on the on the units that they have to ma be maintained in that uh, affordability. It's typically fifty-five. It 50, a fifty-five year contract for providing affordability. We have a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, so this question, uh, how many children will this project add to Hidden Valley Elementary? I, I have absolutely no idea. Um, we're still in the preliminary phases, and we don't know what the makeup is going to be of our tenants. However, I do know that there is um, a fairly steep school fee that will have to be a part of the, uh, the impact uh, of this project and is designed to essentially give the school the resources needed to accommodate those extra students. Okay. okay. Okay, so let's see here. Okay, so who will maintain all of the amenities with this new project? Uh, we are committed to maintain all those, uh, all those amenities. Okay. Could you clarify who is we? Uh, the developer, Sinead Community Development Partners. The, the developer, uh, Sinead Community Development Partners. I couldn't, <laughs> I, 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 we have not not drafted up the contract, but this will be a part of the process that we have with the city of Santa Rosa. Okay, so of the developed area, what is the building coverage percentage? So what's the percentage to the whole property? Let's see. Yeah, I know, I know it is less, less than 50%, but um, what we can do is give that information to the city of Santa Rosa, and they can put that on the website. Sorry, one moment. Okay, so is Santa Rosa City actually considering allowing a 51 unit VETS facility at the entry to cobblestone development? Can you repeat that question? Sure. <laughs> is, um, I'm assuming the city of Santa Rosa actually considering allowing a 51 unit VETS facility at the entry to cobblestone development? So, as the applicant indicated tonight, that is part of their project. So, the city is obligated to consider it, to review it. Doesn't mean that it will be accepted or approved uh, at the completion of the analysis, but if that's what is proposed when the applications come in, that's what the city will evaluate. 
Okay, this is more of a uh, comment versus a question, but the comment is uh, addressing additional cost of more fire and protection, or fire protection and police. So, I'll address that. Uh, so again, back to the EIR, public safety, public services is a topical component. So fire safety and analysis in conjunction with traffic circulation patterns, safe uh, circulation patterns will all be part of the environmental review. And as Bill mentioned earlier, uh, the, the developer is subject to fees. Uh, they're called impact fees. So the, the additional services that would be required to serve the community, the fees go into our general fund or, or to the appropriate departments, such as school fees and uh, the fire department and, uh, and road improvements, that kind of thing. OK. Has anybody asked the residents how they feel about an amphitheater? <laughs> How do you feel about an amphitheater? Okay, all right. Message received. <laughs> the, the question is, is um, based off of the feedback from the crowd, are you still going to pursue putting in an amphitheater? <laughs> I got nothing to say. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Where will the parking be for the soccer field, museum, and amphitheater? Uh, at this point, conceptually, it's behind uh, the parking you see behind the, uh, the commercial center. There are also many, many other solutions for parking other than on-site, including shuttles. So we will explore. OK. We got one taker for a shuttle here. <laughs> OK. So the. <laughs> Thank you. The developed areas on the site plan appear to occupy 75% of the 82-acre property. That leaves less than 20 acres of what most of us think of as open space. How did you calculate 66.8 acres of open space, and are you counting driveways, parking spaces, and landscapes? <laughs> yeah. We used a program called CAD, which took our site plan and we lassoed around all of the development that was there uh, and all of the proposed development and then excluded uh, the rest as open space. Okay. All right, um, this question is, what is the apartment vacancy percentage in Santa Rosa? I'm not sure if we know that offhand. That might have to be a follow-up. It's follow very up. low. Yeah. OK. We might have to look into that one at a later time. OK. I'm, I'm hearing it's around 1%, oh. approximately. OK. Thank you. All right. The Sinead Village site is an animal corridor. Also, many birds use trees on properties for nesting. How will this corridor be protected for wildlife? So as, uh, as Bill had mentioned earlier, the, uh, the project is subject to the environmental impact report, uh, which Bill said was, was the, it's the highest level of, of review that we do. And one of the elements that we look at um, is biological impacts. So, so wildlife corridors, um, there, there'd likely be an attached uh, technical report that is prepared to inform the environmental impact report that looks at specifically at environmental impacts related to wildlife and biology, um, also endangered or threatened species. OK. So if any of the project goes through, will it all become part of the high fire danger area? It, uh, we have our, our city fire department maintains what's called wildland urban interface maps. And they uh, designate certain areas of the city as, as being subject to high, high likelihood for fire. Um, and that comes attached with a whole lot of uh, additional standards that are put on to the development. 
uh, for, for fire safety and, and building construction. Uh, we're not sure if it's, if it's actually in that area, but. Okay. All right. So I have another traffic related question. Why the roundabout? It, it's the worst part of the entire project and won't allow cars from other neighborhoods to enter Sinead due to consistent traffic on a two lane road. Um, that is uh, a, a concept that we put in. Uh, we've seen how effective they are. We've built a couple on Old Redwood Highway. Uh, it, it, again, we're going to have to refer to the traffic study, which is going to tell us whether or not that is going to alleviate uh, any potential traffic issues or not. So um, if it doesn't, obviously, then it will point to, to, to a no. Okay. Does the project require reconfiguring the hillside with massive movements and a removal of material? Um, I, again, we uh, did our very best to develop within uh, the already developed footprint of the previous property. There'll be nine or ten acres, again, that will, uh, will be fresh development and that will absolutely require earth moving. Uh, as will the, the, the rest of it uh, on the fringes of the property. But um, there's, there's a lot of, again, when you're redeveloping something, there's also a lot of dirt that you are going to need to move to balance the site. Okay. Are there any plans to turn Sinead into three lanes each way? How did I get stuck with the microphone on this one? Uh, so the, that particular aspect has not been evaluated. I want to go back to just the, the roundabout. <laughs> Same with the roundabout. Uh, that is a proposal that's coming from the applicant. We'll evaluate that. We being the city's engineering department, traffic engineering department, it'll be part of the traffic study. The same thing holds true for the, the configuration of Sinead and how many lanes it will ultimately be. Simply don't have that answer right now. Okay. So at this time, we're going to begin transitioning to the next segment of the evening. Um, so, which is, we would like to invite folks to come up here to the mics. And if you'd like to ask a question yourselves, we ask that you please actually come up and line up so we can take turns. Don't rush too quickly. <laughs> Great job. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that should be fine. <laughs> yes, I'm going to. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. So, so if anybody needs a round of applause, they should just point to you. You got like four rounds on there. <laughs> a little bit of humor, right? <laughs> All right, everybody. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. We're gonna do a little bit of toggling back and forth just because of the uh, issues with the microphones this evening. All right. 
right. So we're going to keep the two lines, but we're going to go back and forth between each line because I'm going to hand over my sturdy microphone to the table over here. So we'll start over on this side. And I, we just ask that if you could please be as concise as possible um, because there are several people that would like to make some comments or ask questions. So we just ask that everybody be respectful of everybody's time. So uh, with that said, we'll go ahead and ask the first question. My name is Adrian Lobby. I'm with Homeless Action. We would like to know if the property and how the property can be used between now and the construction for the shelter of homeless people, considering that there is a homeless emergency in Santa Rosa. That, uh, that is something we're definitely open to and interested in. However, um, we do not own the property. So um, this, is, uh, this is still county property. Um, we are in contract. Uh, and we'll close upon entitlements, but do not own it yet. So um, I'm sorry that we're, we're the wrong party. I'm Evelyn Anderson. I'm, a, I'm from Hidden Valley Neighborhood, and I'm a trustee on the Santa Rosa City School Board, and tonight I'm here to speak on behalf of the school board um, because we have serious concerns about this project um, and its impact on the schools if the project does not consider traffic infrastructure for student transportation and evacuation. The schools in this residency area are at full capacity. There is no room for any more students. <laughs> the, the, there is no school provided for in the project plan that we've seen so far and development fees alone will not come anywhere near providing what is needed uh, for a new school. Our, our, our district office has estimated that it would require $30 million for a 400 student elementary school, which would be in keeping with the, what's expected to be the student population of this size of development. Um, and regarding evacuation, the students from Hidden Valley School evacuate to Franklin Park which means you have somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 students who need to get to their safe space going down Sinead past this development. Um, and I, for one, am really concerned uh, with getting our students to safety in a disaster as quickly as possible and would not want to risk any blockage or delay. Um, <laughs> I believe the EIR also takes into account public services such as schools. Um, so I really thank you for your time and consideration this opportunity. So just uh, one point really quick. Um, it, it, although it's great to have everybody applaud, we just want to, if maybe you could do like we do at council, wave your hands, just so that we can keep this moving for folks this evening. Thank you, sorry, and thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. It's a beautiful crowd. So I want to share a thought mostly to the crowd, so I don't want to turn my back to you. The psychology of the psychology in containing any crowd be now overcome, and I'll share it out loud. All public servants and politicians, well-intended or not, are cogs in the political wheel. This system, our so-called political animal, has become worse than any lying, thieving, spoiled two-year-old requiring a timeout. Uh, my question is, will you be quiet as I finish what I'm saying? A complete termination of the connection, a 40-day beautiful full moon, high noon, prophetic freedom strike from on high, and that highness resides in our heart. Malcolm X was correct when he said, power never steps back in the face of greater power. It's time for the 40-day strike for freedom and get off our knees to the bankers and their le legions of lawyers. I am that I am, and I say it, you hear it, it will be so. It is done. It's time to shut down the status quo instead of sucking up to a system that has taken out JFK and anybody we're speaking about. And that's where we are, and that's what time it is. If we could ask the police right, officer to you. please come up to the front. All right. OK, moving on. Okay. <clears throat> 
Hi, my name is Frank Schultz. I live at the uh, the ape or the uh, intersection of uh, Terra Linda Drive and Schneid Road on Private Road. You guys drive by my house every day. I don't think you really fully understand the amount of traffic that comes down the road. And as far as a 35 mile per hour speed limit, no, it's 45. Everybody that comes out of of Lomitas Heights, and I'm sure everybody that lives close to this road has taken their life in their hands trying to get onto that road because people do not slow down. And for, for you to propose this type of development that will probably increase the road traffic at least 3,000 cars per day and by the fact, if you were there during the fire and knew that every route that you had there was cut off, and the only way out, the only way out of to get the hell out of the way of this fire was to come out Sinead Road and go down to Mendocino. That was it. It was surreal. You should have been there, and you guys should all be there when this traffic's going. It's all day long. It's not just in the morning. I live there. I hear it all day long. I put up trees in front of my house on the divider strip. I put fences up, everything else to shut it out. But no, you want to just keep making it bigger. How, how big do we want this city? When I moved here 40 years ago that I've lived in this house, there were 59,000 people in this town. Now, from the last thing that I read, there's 175,000 in the city limits. This is getting ridiculous. I don't think you guys, and especially Shirley Zane, will be happy. Until you make this once beautiful city look like frickin' San Jose. And that's where we're headed. Thank you. Hi, this is a question for the developer. My name's Diane Harris. I live in Hidden Valley Estates. What guarantee do we have that you will not just pay in lieu fees instead of building affordable housing? Um, in lieu fees are not part of our plan in any way. And so we've, the plan that we've submitted uh, includes that housing. So the, the city of Santa Rosa, that's what they're considering. Um, that's uh, part, it, it's integral to the plan. Um, so, there's no... Yeah, it, so that was the next question, what about Windsor, and then the same question to the city staff, is there any way to have a guarantee? So there's no requirement from the city at this time for on-site affordable housing. We will respond to the application we receive. Right now, the applicant is indicating that they will be including affordable housing. We will confirm that when the applications are submitted. Hello, my name is Mark Epstein. I'm with the Friends of Pollen Creek. We, we've been trying to get an answer to a question that I think you should be able to tell us on the conceptual design. The Pollen Creek Preserve is parcel N, parcel J, parcel O, and parcel P. Are you building inside of parcel N, the water agency parcel, as part of your plan? Yes, that's correct. The overall, um, the overall amenities for the overall neighborhood are to the north, the further, furthest most north portion of uh, the, the water agency property. So we're not building on parcel J. And, and again, those are only the amenities. Those are not uh, the neighborhood amenities in the trails. So I understand it's the amphitheater. Is it the dog park? Is correct. it the community gardens? What that's, else is it? That's correct. That's it. And then the road that runs through above those the gardens in the park, is that in parcel N as well? No. Okay. And is part of your plan that you plan to present, you know, if not tonight, at the next stage, going to show how you're going to mitigate the impact of 860 units, 67 units on the wildlife and on the preserve, so it's preserved. I mean, our message is preserve the preserve. Sure. We need you to show in your plan that there is a way to absorb 2,000 people sharing this so that it doesn't destroy the thing that we're trying to protect. Well, again, we're putting a conservation easement on Jay, um, in, in part thanks to your effort, and uh, and so we uh, again th that conservation easement will ensure a lot of that. Where the intersection is on Chenet Road and where the hospital, where you go into the hospital is, where the turnaround is, yes. that's uh, 
268 feet above sea level. Uh, the top of where Oakcrest is, or the Sonoma Behavioral Center is, is 318 feet. That's a difference of a height of 50 feet. An average story is 10 feet. So if you build four-story apartments on there, they're gonna be as high as a nine-story building. Um, what is your comment to that? Um, yeah, it very much depends on where you're looking at it from, absolutely. My name is Tom Brown, and this is a question for Mr. Rose. I believe all of the requirements you have for evaluating projects assume a certain set of standards, one of which is not the economic impact of this project. We know that housing doesn't pay for itself. It's often off by a factor of three to four. That's to say that whatever is developed, we're gonna be paying a subsidy for that housing. I don't mind paying a subsidy for housing, and for, especially for low-income housing, but I wanna know the numbers. I want you folks to keep a tab that says, okay, this is what we're gonna get in fees, this is what we're gonna get in 30 years of paying taxes of them on that property, and here's what it's gonna cost us in public infrastructure. And as far as I can tell, they're not obligated to do anything off-site. And if you guys have to widen Park Eight and Parker Hill to more lanes, we're all gonna pay for that. I'd like to see an ongoing report on your website with whatever data you have to tell us the amount of that subsidy. Thank you. My name is Jan Bolt, and I've been a resident of Cobblestone, that development up on the hill for the last 30 years, raised our family there. This area right here uh, is, it doesn't seem to, well, no, I asked them. I asked them for this. They gave it to me. I mean, let, let, me, let me be fair. The city gave it to me. But right here, this area um, is where they're going to put the 51-unit vet group in. And you don't see a building there, but that's what they've just told you, and that's what the plan indicates. My, my dad, Iwo Jima, Saipan, Bougainville, Arua, four years, Marines, my father-in-law, Stalag 17 for a year after being shot down in Germany three times. I have a lot of friends that are vets. I mean, okay, Vietnam vets. I was not one. But everybody that I've talked to has told me that vet community homes are, are strife with drug and alcohol problems and counseling problems, and they're high crime areas. So that's what they want to do, is put at the beginning of the development that I live in Instead of somewhere out here where there's no homes to back up. That's a personal thing, but still, it's wrong that they would do that in there. Just my comment. Thank you. Uh, my name's Steve O'Rourke. I live on Meadow Glen. Um, I have done an informal poll with realtors, and I've spoken to anywhere from 12 to 15 asking about the impact of three-story apartment buildings directly behind properties along Meadow Glen, Hidden Valley, Rolling Hills. And um, there's 100% consensus that property values will drop 10 to 15% if you look out your back window and see a three-story apartment building. And I'm wondering if that's gonna be included in, I don't know if it would be an environmental impact report, but it's certainly impactful. And I'm wondering where and how that might get included into your consideration for the permit process. So, uh, as part of the environmental process, the city does not look at economic impacts uh, on a project by project basis. However, when we mention those entitlements that the project uh, is subject to, one of those is a hillside development permit. So it's subject to a public hearing which will be in front of our planning commission, and they have to make certain findings on how development is done uh, in concert with the, with the hillsides that we have in Santa Rosa. Additionally, in the environmental impact report, there is a, a topical area of aesthetics. So the, uh, the visual impact of the project is also something that's going to be analyzed as part of that EIR process. Frank Ager, owner of Franklin Avenue property for 40 years. The Ager family first came to the West County in the early 1920s. I fought the Hanley Fire in 1964. The Tubbs Fire was a repeat of the Hanley Fire. The, city, the Santa Rosa City Council and Sonoma County Board of Supervisors learned nothing from previous fires. Everyone blames PG&E. 
I have no doubt if the city of Santa Rosa and Sonoma County are added as defendants in the fire losses, they will also be held liable. You couldn't evacuate Fountain Grove. You, you couldn't evacuate Fountain Grove, you won't be able to evacuate Sinead. It's time for the Santa Rosa City Council and Sonoma County Board of Supervisors to accept their legal liability for current and future fire losses. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Jim Barnes. I live up on Cobblestone by Jan Bolt, actually. Anyway, the, my issue is with the LLC and what's going to happen with liability. As we found with the same developer in the, the uh, uh, with the uh, Villa Capri matter, there's a lawsuit and he's being responsible for it, but in, in, or is being sued for it. But in this case, when this is developed out, Who's going to be left who's going to be a liable when we can't get out because we could not get out during the fire and there's, there's damages and, and deaths and people get injured and, um, and there's no developer or anybody to go after because he's going to be long gone and with the LLC, as I'm sure all of you know, there's no liability. There's nobody left. It's like a corporation. There's bankrupt out the corporation, there'll be nobody left. And so who's going to be liable? And is it going to be ongoing? And how is the city of Santa Rosa going to be assured that when something does happen, and it will, because there's earthquake faults on there, that, there's, that the people that are injured can receive just compensation? Hello, I'm Teresa Wallowick, Cobblestone Community. I'm a retired fire captain, SFFD. I think you have to address the safety of your community. You cannot keep ignoring it and pretend it doesn't exist. We have had, over the years, so many fires, earthquakes, problems, and it keeps going on. You have to address it. What is happening here? There's no concern about safety here. There's no concern about quality of life. What I'm seeing is a town of rental buildings, four-story rental buildings. One way in, one way out. You're looking at the same situation. Sinead was a nightmare. It continues to be a nightmare every day. I want to know where the home ownership is. Who takes responsibility for the deaths of pedestrians, motorcyclists, cyclists? The county, the city, the developer? No. We'll find somebody. We'll blame somebody else. It'll be like that. Where's the home ownership? Who will bear the burden of additional needs? Taxpayers, not renters. Who gets the money? The developer. Who will ask for bond measures that add to our taxes? The city. There is no plan here. You need to look at it. We're not against development. We're against the density of this development. And I would like to like make one last point. I hear the term, we are developing 50% of the property. You cannot include a preserve as a non-development. That is already in there. That cannot be used to say we're only developing 50%. Uh, good evening, Peter Rumble from the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber of Commerce. I'm also a resident of uh, the Junior College neighborhood, sort of the north end, so um, certainly not uh, on Cobblestone and, and some of the surrounding neighborhoods, but uh, fairly close. Um, I want to just say thank you to everybody for coming out and expressing uh, their, their thoughts, their opinion, their input. It is an incredibly an emotional project. Uh, I know it from two sides, both from the county side as, as well as uh, uh, from the chamber side and sitting in the room. Uh, and I think that uh, all of the comments will be addressed in due course uh, through the city's planning process. Uh, and so I don't want to go through and try to talk about each one of those points. They're all meaningful. Uh, they all uh, are coming from a, a place of concern for the community. What I will say is I am incredibly appreciative of a developer who's willing to build housing in Santa Rosa. And in particular, housing that is uh, at least 20% uh, for uh, the people who can't afford to buy a home. 
Uh, so I would love for my kids and for the next generation to be able to stay in Santa Rosa and to be able to afford a, a place to live that isn't necessarily a single family home with a pool in a backyard. Uh, I think it's perfectly acceptable uh, and desperately needed from uh, an employer perspective as well as for a community health perspective. I also very much appreciate that the development is going in on already paved areas and not uh, going into uh, the preserved uh, spaces. So, uh, so I'll end it with uh, just a sense of appreciation both for the housing that's coming in as well as for the community's uh, continued engagement to make the, the project as successful as possible. My name is Craig Olson, <clears throat> part of the Poland Creek, Friends of Poland Creek Preserve. And I'm interested to know, what's your understanding of the purpose of a preserve? And how does building two miles of trails through it aid the purpose of that preserve? This is a question for you. Uh, the intention of the trails is to create um, usable space in those areas um, and, uh, and additionally um, we're, we're staying within where trails have already been cut through. And what's the purpose of a preserve? Purpose of the preserve? Yeah, what's the purpose of, the preser of I, a preserve? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, can, I can look it up real quick, but it, uh, you seem... I would you, suggest that's a please. basic part of building a huge project next to a preserve is to actually understand... It's actually an important part of building a huge project next to a fragile, precious preserve in the middle of a town to build 867 units next to it. You, I would expect you to understand what a preserve is and to work hard to mitigate the effect on it, which would include not building trails. We, we very much look forward to working with you and in, in, in furthering that goal, absolutely. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Natalie Balfour and I have been a resident of Sonoma County for the majority of my life. Um, I moved away to go to college and even though I wanted to move back to Sonoma County, I was unable to until my parents were able to help me out. Um, I realized looking around the room that I represent um, a population that's not really here right now. So I'm probably gonna get some booze and definitely wow. No clapping, but maybe um, I represent the children and grandchildren of the people here. And I just want to say that I am hopeful that the community that I was raised in um, can be open-minded and open-armed and uh, accepting of people who want to move here instead of uh, closed-minded. Um, my question is, will this development increase the availability for housing for people under ages uh, 35 and under. Thanks. You talk about your demographic? Yeah, I mean, that's, again, because of the uh, lack of affordable housing and the lack of rental units available in this. Um, it's the less established. It's the checkers and baggers uh, at Oliver's who are, they're having a heck of a time finding, finding a workforce. Um, it's, uh, it's our teachers. It's, it, it's, just, it's everybody that provides the services for, for our city, and they're unfortunately being priced out. Uh, that was a major part of our decision making in creating this housing. Good evening, I'm Mark Krug with Burbank Housing. I've, over the years, I've been involved with a lot of community processes and neighborhood meetings, and I'm here to tell you that they always improve projects. So I just want to thank everyone for coming out. It's a long evening, and appreciate the input. Um, as Comrade Comron said earlier, Burbank um, is, is slated to help with the affordable housing aspects of this project, and we're very happy to do that. Uh, we want to applaud the proposal for um, setting aside 20% of the units for very low-income families. Um, Comron mentioned what those rent levels would be around $900 per month. What he didn't mention was the incomes that go with that, and that's a family of four of up to about 45,000. So those apartments would be targeting that, um, that group of people who are really desperately in need of affordable housing. I think probably everyone would agree that before the fires hit, we already had an acute shortage of 
market and affordable housing in the, in the county in Santa Rosa. And I don't know what comes after the word acute, but after the fires, we're really in dire straits. So I'm just supportive of the project and really um, thankful to see a development that will bring some much needed housing to the community. Thank you again. Yes, my name is, oh, sorry. <laughs> wow. um, my name is Morgan Pickering. I live in Cobblestone. And uh, I think we've heard a lot about uh, development and the need for more housing. I don't think there's any question that we need more housing. But one doesn't have to do with the other. I think that uh, for the people, I'd like to make one statement and a couple of questions. For the people who lost their lives and homes, I find it a, pretty much a disgrace uh, and a, that this monstrosity could even be put forth here. Um, that's, I just, uh, I mean, we're talking, we're talking about more housing, but at what cost? We're gonna put people's lives and people's houses in danger as we've just experienced last October. I think, I think it's just pretty outrageous. Uh, two questions, uh, one for the, uh, for the city. Uh, you made sort of a, whatever, um, sort of a telling comment in the beginning that, and I kind of wonder that all this public comment of what we're going through today is uh, any indication of how much influence that we're going to have on this whole process. I think there was a comment in the beginning that we're going to go ahead with this regardless of what you guys think. I'm not, I just want to know, if did I mis mishear that? That's question number one. And number two, this is directed to the developer. Uh, this hasn't been brought up yet, but I would like to uh, ask you maybe how you could go uh, talk about how this whole competitive bid process was under, undertaken <laughs> under a rather clandestine, uh, <laughs> under the, uh, under rather clandestine uh, uh, appearances. Uh, there's no transparency at all. Well, we had one other bid that fell by the wayside rather quickly. And also, I have a very, I'm, the comments by the supervisor, Zane, I just find really obnoxious how she can accuse people. <laughs> You know, okay, I'm, I'm wrapping it up. <laughs> but anyway, uh, how she can accuse uh, all of us that are impacted the most of NIMBYism, I find really, <laughs> really outrageous, considering she lives very comfortably in the McDonald area. So, but again, my question to the developer, how, if you could go over how this process of the bid was uh, proposed, how this whole thing went through, since there was no transparency, very little public input at all, and also from the city, just what influence we're going to have after all of this great talk we've had tonight and the feel good. What influence are we really going to have on your decisions? Thank you. So I think the, the comment that, that you heard earlier was uh, Bill said, we as a city are obliged when um, an applicant puts forward a proposal, we take it in for consideration. Um, uh, as we talked about at the beginning, this is a very public process. There's the environmental review track. There's also the public review track. So there's, there's meetings that will be in front of our design review board, our planning commission, and our city council. Um, each of those, as was mentioned, is a public hearing. So we're open for input. All the comments that we received tonight are being made part of this project file. Um, and our decision makers will, at the end of the day, consider whether this is the right fit as it's designed. And um, as I mentioned, there's, there's three different bodies. Um, and they'll be making that determination. But public input, that's the reason we have a public hearing, so. I'd like to add just one comment. So you hear city staff continually referring to the environmental impact report, and it's such a comprehensive analysis. It includes many of the, the areas that we're hearing tonight. One of the first steps after the city selects a consultant to prepare that will be what's called a scoping meeting. And that will be, a, in addition to the concept design review I mentioned that will likely occur on August 2nd, the scoping meeting will be where city staff and the consultants have a public meeting where we can take all of the comments, all of the concerns, questions, and what it will do is inform the analysis. So that's the, the other meeting that is probably a couple months down the road that I would encourage you all to be on the lookout for because that's where we will drill down deeper into all of these topical areas. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Hui Han Liu, and actually I, um, I moved to, uh, I, I'm from uh, Cobblestone Communities. And I moved to the Cobblestone actually the last uh, June. And um, I, 
I had a very simple, just two, two questions. And number one, I think is for, I don't think is the right location for the zooming. And uh, it's because I, I think if uh, we build a, uh, you know, the, for, for those like a low income uh, family uh, communities, I think is, is the best way if uh, it, it can be walkable to the downtown area. Uh, <clears throat> because, um, you know, in the, the zoning around this area is more kind of like a suburban uh, rather than just, uh, you know, cl close to the downtown. Uh, and <clears throat> another main issue is, I think, is the, uh, I think the traffic. Uh, in Chennai, I think is the, because I experience is, uh, you, I mean, everyone experience is the, you know, five storm, you know, is the last October. I think it's really scary. Because uh, I, I experienced, like, because uh, we are in the Copperstone community, we have the only one exit. Um, so to me, I think the, the main priority things, I think, is the Chennai, how you can solve the sort out the traffic. Because uh, you look at over there, you know, all the communities, if uh, something that happen, uh, you know, another five storm is coming or something, I mean, how you can sort out all those traffic, because uh, Chennai now is just a two-way. And if we, we don't have the many more lanes, I mean, at least about two or three lanes, and otherwise, uh, I think uh, that would be uh, very uh, risky. You know, uh, I think that's the main issue. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Mary Jane Mornet. I live in the Hillber Hillcrest subdivision. I've lived there for 45 years. Um, as many of you have lived in this area and for more than since uh, prior to 1978, you probably have Prop 13 taxes and love living in your neighborhood. And as for where, who's gonna have, where the children are going to go down the line, you're, these homes that you're living in now are probably going to go to your family members, your children, your grandchildren, for them to do with as they like. Um, I suspect that there's more to this whole thing than just getting this place done. It, first of all, it's devaluing our properties. And um, we're going to have to move. And when we move, then you're going to get higher taxes rather than Prop 13 taxes from everybody who's here. But also, my big concern is Sinead Road. Sinead Road has been the fire break for two major fires came down Petrified Forest Road, Marquest Springs. If it hadn't been for Sinead, for the firefighters stopping the fires at Sinead, Santa Rosa City would not exist today. Had the fire crossed in eight road this last time, and I was up there every single night patrolling that fire to make sure the fire didn't come down all the way down Parker Road, because if it did, none of us would have our homes today. None of us in this area would have our homes today. Our cobblestone and Terra Linda. If the fire crosses Sinead Road, we're all out of it. Santa Rosa City would not exist. And two major fires were stopped right in that area in 1964 and again last October. This is an ill-conceived plan. You're putting these kinds of homes in, in established residential neighborhoods, single-family homes. If you're going to put something in there, put some single-family homes in there at modest prices that workers can afford. Find another place in town, because you're going to have to build markets, <laughs> banks, gas stations, beauty salons. You're going to have to build everything to support all these new people. There's nothing there to support any of them. Can you see all those people going to the Safeway down the hill or the two gas stations, the Safeway and, and Chevron station? You can't get in them now. There is no room for more people coming in, in this kind of neighborhood. You've got to put single family homes in there or nothing. It's a bad idea. Good evening. My name is Christine Veif, and I live on Sinead Road, right across the street from Hidden Valley School. And I am wondering why we cannot take care of the current speeding problems that we have on Sinead right now. It's very dangerous, and I'm out front quite often. If you're not driving 65 miles down the road, then you can wave to me. And, <laughs> you know, our city is, we need more monitoring missing out on an awful lot of revenue in tickets. You have a 25 mile an hour zone, 25 miles an hour, you have a red light that 
is run quite often, and that is a hefty fine and a ticket. Now, throw in a couple of uh, orange cones and double it. So it would be just nice <laughs> to have an officer there, daily even, and especially at night. It's a racing zone. Dangerous, we have um, wrecks I hear screech all the time and smash, and I have trouble, you know, getting my mail. I have to go out to the street and step one foot in there and make sure that I'm, there's no cars coming. So come on, get some more revenue and let's correct this problem before we add to it. Thank you. Hi, my name's uh, Jim Trapnell and I live in the Hidden Valley neighborhood, kind of, at, I think, at the bottom there. Um, I had one or two questions. One is with the senior housing area, I would like some clarification on that because the last thing we need is an even an area even bigger than Villa Capri to evacuate. Uh, in reference to Villa Capri, I wanted to ask the city how comfortable they are dealing with a very powerful man like Mr. Gallagher who tried to scrape Villa Capri clean before he was supposed to even be in there. And who uh, incidentally is also being investigated for campaign finance laws by contributing to city council candidates through his employees. So I wonder how the city could comment on their ease of doing business with that kind of a personality. And lastly, a comment that I don't necessarily disagree with some of the project, though I do think the scope is hyperbolic. And the concept of apartments in this part of town that are taller than almost any apartment in Santa Rosa downtown seems a little off kilter to me. Thank you. Yes, hi, thank you for being here. Um, so I actually serve at the mental health peer run center that's closing and coming off the hill. So uh, my stakeholder group has been tracking the process and progress of this for several years from, a, from that spot in the circle. But what I'm very concerned about is my awareness, um, both for the last several years and tonight, that really none of the stakeholders are being listened to. None of the stakeholders are really being invited to participate, so not the neighborhood. And so it's great that we're all together at this meeting, but what I want to ask the city to tell all of us is how are you gonna build in a process of actual dialogue in the actual decision making? So that the people who are so profoundly impacted can actually be part of the conversation in a meaningful way instead of an ostensible way. And my concern you know, I, I can see that you're good people with good hearts, and if the folks making these decisions are not elected, there's nothing to compel you to listen to the community voices. And I feel really worried about that, and I would like to ask the city that you make commitments about these things contractually so that we can feel um, assured that the things that the developer is agreeing to, that you're actually going to be able to do that as the economy shifts or whatever happens. So please build in space for us in a much more meaningful way. Thank you. No? No answers? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, so I have a brief comment and a brief question. One is that the, my comment is that population-wise, 40% of us are living in poverty. The percent of, of low-income housing in this county is, is, almost, is negligent, tiny. 20% doesn't make up for that. 20% doesn't begin to make up for that. And we'll be very lucky if we get anywhere near that 20% as well. Historically speaking, it doesn't happen. They just pay a fee for each unit they don't build, or they build it somewhere else or something. So that's pretty concerning to me. Uh, in, in addition, we're subsidizing this project enormously already by the city uh, selling it for a very minimal price. 
So I think for all that subsidy, we deserve answers about public transportation, about public services, about our environment. People are really concerned about uh, the environmental impact of this, and I want to ask, is, does this environmental impact report take into account that you're displacing a major environmental service provider for which the city, the county, and the developer have absolutely no plans, have no, have no guarantee that they're going to find a place for them, that they're going to subsidize a move, that they're going to do anything? Does the environmental impact report take into consideration that that major service provider that's caring for a critical part of our ecology, the native avian wildlife, isn't going to be cared for? Yeah, could we have an answer? Please. It's my understanding that the county who owns this property, they have entered into this agreement to sell this property and many of those services are county services. So at this point, and again, the city has not analyzed this in great detail, I think that's a question that would be best directed to the county to see where they might be replacing or uh, relocating those services. Okay. Well, um, I live up near Sycamore Avenue, and I'll just keep this quick. Um, what can we do to stop the entire project and leave the entire space as it is right now? And I would like an answer, please. I hope you'll appreciate that I can't give you a direct pathway to stop this project. But what I can do is this is a formidable group of people and I just it, it would encourage you again to stay involved in this process. I know you will and that's the best response that I can give to you. Thank you for your response. Hello. I live up by on Sycamore Avenue as well and I have some specific questions. So how many additional vehicles per day will be on Sinead with the current housing proposal, um, you know, assuming that there's at least one car per unit and two cars per multifamily unit? Um, again, I know we kind of already know that's a big number, but I was wondering if you guys had specifics on how many. We do not, but what I can tell you is this, that that question will be directly answered in a traffic impact study. Um, so even though we know the amount of um, units right now, you don't have an answer for how many cars each unit it will It would be have. irresponsible for me to give a guess. There are so many different types of units there that, that my response is that the traffic study will give that specific information. I simply don't have that information. Okay. And um, is the only... I can't quite tell from the maps. So the only way in and out of the neighborhoods that are proposed is Sinead. You're not going to be using like Beverly Way or any of the other surrounding neighborhoods for traffic? That's correct. As is proposed, no. Okay. So it's just Sinead. Okay. My name is Peter Schindler. I live in Lomita Heights. I'm curious as to why you would take this property and think that you're doing people a service, especially people of low income, by sticking them up a mountain and not putting them downtown by Railroad Square or somewhere where there's public transportation, <laughs> trains, stores, you could build markets. It just, it, it's, it, it defies my logic of why you think this is a good idea. And I'd like you to tell me why this is a good idea. Well, we are, we're looking for where we can get housing throughout the city. As a city, that's a top priority that we're working on. So in addition to uh, developments in, in this area, we're also putting a, a very strong effort at getting more housing downtown. Um, you may have heard we're, we're taking on an initiative right now, which is to, uh, to look at the factors that are the reason that we don't have a lot of housing downtown. And so how that plays into the addition of the smart train and also our transit mall. So we are looking at 
opportunities throughout the city where we can get more housing and more affordable housing. So you're comfortable ruining all these neighborhoods? Here, Sir. Right over here on the right side, all those houses in there. I have friends in there. And you're going to put a Sir. Sir. Please. Please, sir. Hi, my name is Daisy Pistilla, and I'm speaking as a resident of Santa Rosa. Um, I, am a, I was born in Sonoma County. I'm 36 years old. It doesn't, it's not lost on me as I look around this room that I'm quite young compared to this audience. And I'm trying to move back to Sonoma County right now, and it's incredibly hard to find, to find housing that I can afford. And I don't know if this is the right development. I don't know if it's the right location. But what I do know is that we need more housing in this county. We need affordable housing in this county. And if all of you are going to stand here and oppose this development, I encourage you and challenge you. Will you show up when other developments come forward that are in these appropriate areas and as ferociously support them? Because if you won't, then in fact you are NIMBYs. And I don't think you are necessarily, but I will, I will challenge you to prove it by supporting the housing that our generation desperately needs in order to have your children and grandchildren live here. My understanding is that this school district has declining enrollment because people have left after the fires and this county as a whole is aging. I've seen it, I've moved back after being gone for 10 years. We need more housing, I'm not saying here, but I'm challenging you to support housing and support dense housing on the developable land within our city borders because we need more. My question to the city and the county is, given that this is a very remote location from the city core, what are your plans for potentially putting in some sort of a transportation, like public transportation, a shuttle or a bus that could help get both the low income people who may end up living there and others in the community who may no longer be able to drive soon getting them in and out of this area, because that could help with some of the problems of traffic. So the transportation and traffic element that I mentioned that's part of our environmental analysis, if it concludes that additional bus stops are needed, bike lanes, alternate forms of transportation are required, and this project is required to implement those, those will become potentially mitigations or conditions of approval. So that. That is a, a direct responsibility for the city to analyze as part of this project. My name is Nancy Lands, and I live in Lameda Heights. I have children that attend Hidden Valley Elementary School. They are both very athletic in this city. One, we do need housing. This is not the right place for 800 units. Every day, I take my life and my children's lives at risk as I turn left onto Sinead to take them to school. It's way too small of a road to support that. The other thing, we do need housing. This is the wrong site. You also need to consider the fact that the county has now floated the idea of placing one to 2,000 units at the current county complex. Have you been through that intersection where Pete's Coffee is? <laughs> How many times have you sat there and watched the light turn as you're trying to rush home to get your kids to their next event? It's ridiculous. You can't make it wider there without taking out buildings. You can't make anything wider through there without a lot of money of taxpayer money. And I personally don't want my taxpayer money used to support this man's profit. He's going to make $100 million on this profit, and I don't want my taxpayer dollars widening the roadway. The other way, excuse me, the other way to attract families and keep them in this town and to bring them here besides jobs and affordable housing, and I am a professional property manager, so I'm well aware of the, professional, of the property issues around here, is athletic facilities for youth. I see very little athletic facilities in this community. The boys play baseball at Rincon Valley Little League. It's a gorgeous facility. The girls are shut off on the same softball fields I played on in 1974 on the side of Rincon Valley Middle School. At any day, the school district can take those fields away. This is the perfect opportunity to build some very high class, wonderful athletic facilities that this community desperately needs to attract families and keep them here. Because that's what they need. We're constantly shuttling. You could, move, you could move the Steel Lane Rec Center to that site and develop the Steel Lane Rec Center instead. That's much closer to shopping. It's closer to the community hub. There are many things you could do with this community and in this area. And softball fields and sports fields, that traffic comes off commute hours. It can help there too. 
but you've got to rethink this project for the benefit of the whole community. You cannot solve Santa Rosa's housing crisis in one location. Okay, so we're just about out of time, so we're gonna take these last four here, and then we're gonna um, go ahead and conclude the evening. However, we will have city staff available for you to, um, we'll stay after, so if you have any follow-up questions. So we'll take these last four, and then we'll move on to the end. Hi, I actually work at the Bird Rescue Center. Um, we still are currently on the property, for anybody who didn't know we existed. <laughs> Um, it may be above my pay grade, but now that I see that some of the other facilities that were on the property have been worked with and the potential for preserve, is there any particular reason why we weren't considered? There was no particular reason at all. Um, as I understand it, you're working with the county? Yeah, but it's county property, but you know, it's your plan. Yes. So, <laughs> I mean, I, it's disheartening to see that, it's disheartening to see that clearly some of the other organizations were approached. And with the concern about environmental impact and obviously trying to maintain a preserve, one organization that is strictly wildlife and a complete nonprofit I'm just wondering if there was any reasoning behind not including us. Not at all. It was our, our understanding that the county was working with you guys and finding new, uh, a new location. No. They're not. <laughs> I just want to. <laughs> uh, why, not, why don't you see me afterwards and we can start a dialogue, okay? Thank you. Hi, my name is Julie Collins, and I live in Lamita Heights. I've been there since June of 1975. In October, I believe it was 19, no, I believe October of 2016, the county invited the community to the VETS building, where the first proposals were made to the public regarding the Chenate Village. At that time, the county uh, leader of that meeting got up and said, tonight we are presenting a dream on behalf of the county. It is our dream and I hope it becomes your dream too. I remember those words specifically because at that time I thought it was a nightmare. And the plans that we've seen are fulfilling that vision. And you were asked something earlier from that uh, point, I forget what the question was, but your answer made me feel as if you were reiterating, this is the dream moment. And now, instead of being just as a representative from the county's perspective, it's as if you're a representative from what we should expect of our city, and this is not what we expect for our city. I left that meeting knowing that, along with any of the other meetings that I've attended in 40 years of living here, whether it was the Fountain Grove Parkway, the Nielsen Ranch, projects on the west side of town that did not benefit those people, for the communities, they deserved more. I knew that that meeting was not just come and have a dream with us. It was a fishing expedition so you could know where your next volleys were coming so you could defend your project at the next venture through the next part of the process. I'm feeling that tonight's meeting is the same thing. It is a presentation of the dream, and we all know that that's going to change as it goes through the city, through all of the various entities, we know that. But again, it's a fishing expedition and we're not taking the bait, and we're not going to go away. My hope is that the outpouring of passion from people in the entire city isn't going to dwindle in the next 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, whatever it takes through the process.
And I think you've seen tonight that people are adamant in protecting the integrity of this area, number one, and the greater area of Santa Rosa, and that we also work at getting housing for young people. I have three sons in their 40s. I'd love to have all my kids and grandkids near me. That We know that's not happening today. So I, I hope that what you take away from this meeting tonight is that people in this room, in this community, want what's best for Santa Rosa, not for our own little neighborhoods. As negatively as I'm going to be impacted by this monstrosity, I'm not just speaking for myself and my neighborhood. I want to stay here for as long as God allows me on this earth. Your project might be done, and I might be done before that. I hope not, because I want to see something good happen up there. Thank you. Hi, I'm James Arrieta from uh, Montecito Heights. And uh, I sat here for two hours and watched everyone here sort of talk. And uh, I figure a lot of people really don't like this project. Um, <laughs> but I think that most of your anger is misconstrued. Um, to be honest with you, this is just a representative team for the developer. And to be honest, he's done a very good job. Um, and these are just some city people here. But the point of the matter is, is that a lot of you are unhappy for various reasons. And at the end of the day, these guys are going to go home, and they're probably not going to care. He's going to go home, and he's going to say that, well, I got through that. And you guys are probably still going to be upset. But the core issue here is that you guys seem to all seem to think that you're not being listened to. And I think that's probably true, too. So if you guys agree with that, I would suggest, instead of being angry at these people and giving them a hard time, Telling your friends that there's a problem and you're not being listened to and tell everyone you know and with that go further and start a recall campaign for the entire city council. Hi, my name is Mark Sullivanoff. And I hadn't actually planned to speak tonight. Uh, I just wanted to come out and be supportive of the community's concerns and hear what the city and the developer uh, were going to bring to the table. Um, I've lived in the Hidden Valley neighborhood for nearly 20 years. We did lose our home in the fire of October 8 and 9. And uh, we uh, were able to find a place off Sinead. And every day for the last nearly 20 years, I've driven up and down Sinead. I've driven up and down Parker Hill. And we talk about doing studies and checking impacts and all of that. We all know that depending on what the intention is, reports can say and be construed to say different things. Just as someone who drives that road every day, so people have mentioned, the road cannot handle additional traffic. I don't need a study or report to tell me the road cannot handle additional traffic. <laughs> My concern is you'll do a study, you put it in the file, it documents what you want to believe. The reality is we're also hundreds of houses short in the neighborhood like mine that are sitting empty. I don't know how you do a study with empty lots on a community that I was trying to evacuate that night, as many of these people were. I don't know if you were there or you were there. It was very scary. It was not a, and then every day, but anyway, being on that. The other concern I had is um, we saw the city is going through a process. Well, people have talked about the fires in Fountain Grove. As I recall, and I didn't come prepared to study this, but as I recall in my brain when we approved that that was actually not according to the guidelines within the city rules at the time to put that massive cut through the natural environment over the top and rape that whole land. As a result now, the city that we care about has been negatively impacted. Doctors, business owners, leaders, people in the community have been disrupted. My father passed away of cancer because he could not get the treatment because the doctor's lives were upset. So I'm telling you, when we go and do things that are against the 
what we know is right and the codes and the cities and, and the impact, there are consequences that are real consequences and it affects human lives in this city. It may not affect yours, but it affects us in this city. I'm also a real estate developer. I have no problem with developing real estate. I'm trying to develop nine units in Sonoma County to provide for housing. I'm not as big as Gallagher, but that's my effort. I'm sorry to take so long. But this is clearly not appropriate for that location. Um, please come back with an appropriate development and we can all get behind it. The city of Santa Rosa, please, we need more affordable housing. There are spots. Let's go five, six stories. Let's get over that. Let's put it there. Let's put people where they can get the walkability and the services they need. It makes sense. Let's just be common sense. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carol Parasek. Um, I live in Hidden Valley, and this is sort of anticlimactic, but I just wanted to know what you guys um, are going to do about water. Um, and I'm talking about like water catchment systems and things like that. I know there are some communities in Marin County that are, for hillside developments, they're requiring homeowners to put in tanks, both for fire suppression and for whatever. So I think right now, I mean, we're always in a case of being in droughts and things like that. So when you have a development like this, uh, I'd want to know what the water how, how you were going to do something. I mean, are you going to put rainwater catchment systems in or what? So, thank you. So I can briefly touch on that. Um, we do have what's called a water efficient landscape ordinance here in the city, so every new development is subject to it. So a part of this project would be to, uh, to provide how they're addressing stormwater. Also, um, it is subject to city fire So, so stormwater and water supply, they're parts of the environmental impact report. Um, and it would be a component of this project that goes through the public process, and then also when it goes through the building permit process, it's reviewed by, um, by city and state fire codes too, so. Okay, well, well thank you everybody again for coming. We will have city staff around if you have any follow-up questions. You can find them up here at the front. Thank you again.